This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Mimi Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We spend the rest of the hour with James Risen, the twice Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter, formerly with The New York Times, now with The Intercept. He's just published a major new book that looks at a watershed moment in American intelligence history, when Idaho Senator Frank Church led the Church Committee investigating for the first time the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA during hearings from 1975 to 76. It was officially called the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities. This is Senator Frank Church speaking during one of the committee hearings. We have seen today the dark side of those activities, where many Americans who were not even suspected of crime uh, were not only spied upon, uh, but they were harassed, they were discredited, and at times endangered. And this is another clip from the Church Committee Senate hearing, CIA Director William Colby testifying. He was asked if he found the work of the committee unwelcome. No, I do not. I, as I've said to the chairman, uh, I welcome the chance to try to describe to the American people what intelligence is really about today. It's, uh, it is an opportunity to show how we Americans have modernized the whole concept of intelligence. So that's CIA Director William Colby testifying by the Church Committee, which investigated U.S. assassination targets from Castro in Cuba to Lumumba in uh, Congo to Diem in Vietnam. This is the focus of the new book by James Risen, titled The Last Honest Man, the CIA, the FBI, the Mafia, and the Kennedys in One Senator's Fight to Save Democracy. Uh, Jim, this is a fascinating read. It is so important, even, what, some 50 years later. If you can talk about why you focused on Senator Church, who at one time hoped to be president of the United States, but the significance of these hearings and what you were most shocked by in the revelations uh, that he discovered um, around U.S. government activity around the world. Sure. Yeah. The reason I, I wanted to write this book was, you know, I was covering the CIA for The New York Times uh, at the time of 9-11. And uh, I was, uh, if you remember, Dick Cheney uh, started, after 9-11, started complaining constantly that the reason the uh, CIA and the FBI had failed to uncover the terrorist plots was because of the Church Committee, which was a very odd thing to say. Uh, because the Church Committee had uh, taken place 25 years earlier, and Frank Church was long dead by that time. Uh, but it became the mantra of the Bush administration that it was the Church Committee's uh, tighter rules on uh, U.S. intelligence operations that had led to the weakness of intelligence, uh, which was a lie, uh, but it was a very powerful lie that continued for years. And so I all after... I started uh, reading about the Church Committee because of uh, Dick Cheney's uh, constant uh, carping about it, and I decided uh, eventually that I, it was something that I really wanted to write a book about. The Church Committee, I think, is probably the most important congressional investigation in modern American history. Uh, it was a watershed moment in the history of uh, the CIA and the FBI and the NSA. Anybody who worked at those uh, organizations, the intelligence community, knows that there is a before and after. There's a before the church committee and what we could get away with, and there's an after the church committee and what we were, what rules we were now imposed on them to limit their power and their uh, flexibility. And I think that's, it's, it's, uh, you've got to get back into the mindset of the time and remember there was no congressional oversight whatsoever of the CIA, the FBI, or the NSA for three decades. And Frank Church was brought in. Uh, this committee was created in 1975 for the, to conduct the very first oversight and very first investigation ever conducted of the CIA. And uh, at the time, you got to remember the FBI 
was just as uh, much of a rogue organization. J. Edgar Hoover had just died, and he had run the organization since its founding, and no one had ever questioned his authority or his power. And the NSA at the time, very few Americans even knew it existed. It was even more secretive, far more secretive even than it is today. Uh, and so the hearings were explosive, and uh, they led to changes in the laws, changes in executive orders, uh, led to the creation of permanent congressional intelligence oversight, and it was uh, it had a dramatic impact on American uh, national security policy. And, and Jim, you mentioned J. Edgar Hoover. He had died in 1972, a few years before the committee. Would this committee right. have even been possible had J. Edgar Hoover not uh, died? Because you you point out how how critical he was to the incipient development of a police state right here in the United States. I wonder if you could talk about that as well, his role uh, in, uh, in yeah. developing this early motion move toward a police state. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, when the church committee was, was created, it was originally just going to be what they called the CIA committee, and they were just going to investigate the CIA. But church, Frank Church and others on the committee very quickly realized they had to investigate the FBI. And uh, Church and others later admitted they never would have been able to investigate the FBI at the time if J. Edgar Hoover was still alive. He was so powerful. Uh, he had been able to pressure and blackmail and intimidate everyone, both in Congress and in the White House, ever since, you know, uh, before World War II. He was probably the most uh, powerful secret uh, figure in modern American history. And he was able to turn the FBI into uh, like a Gestapo organization, especially in the post-World War II era when uh, he began the, the, the whole communist red-baiting uh, witch hunts uh, and then moved on from uh, that in the 1960s to harass the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Uh, and so he had a, this long history of uh, constant harassment of anyone who opposed him or opposed the status quo in the United States. And he did it in a, a way that uh, he had intimidated everyone in Congress who believed that he had blackmail material on them. Whether he did or not, they all believed it. And uh, so no one was willing to take him on. Uh, until, uh, or even investigate the FBI in any meaningful way until he was dead. One of the, one of the really interesting things that I learned was uh, the, the famous uh, burglary of the FBI office in Medea, Pennsylvania, I think in 1971, uh, where the uh, burglars who were basically anti-war dissidents uh, took a bunch of documents and then began to understand what they were looking at uh, only after they had taken the documents and they started parceling them out to uh, members of Congress and journalists who they thought would, would be helpful in uh, disclosing and airing um, the information that they were uh, providing to them. And they were sending it to them anonymously and they were sending to very liberal members of Congress and one of the things that I learned that was shocking was that those members of Congress immediately turned them back to the FBI without doing anything with them. And uh, some of the journalists they sent them to did the same thing. And it was it just showed showed how powerful the hold J. Edgar Hoover had on people because he was still alive at that time. And your uh, your review and uh, re reporting on several of the major assassination attempts uh, that uh, that government agencies, especially the CIA, were involved in. You spent a lot of time talking back about the key mafia figures: uh, uh, Johnny Roselli, a mobster from California, and and uh, Sam Giancana, uh, another mobster, a key mobster from Chicago. They were both assassinated. One. After testifying before the Church Commission, and the other one just before he was about to testify right. before the the Church Committee. Could you, uh, for right. those, especially for younger for younger listeners and viewers who are not aware of this whole uh, this whole issue of 
uh, what happened with the attempt to kill Castro and the Kennedy assassination. Could you go through some of that? Yeah, yeah. In the in the, at the end of the Eisenhower administration, uh, the CIA be, uh, decided. You know, Dwight Eisenhower was very interested. It was pushing uh, the CIA to try to kill Castro, uh, and uh, the CIA decided that one way they could do it is to uh, form an, a secret alliance with the mafia. And so they had a, they arranged for a former FBI agent named Bob Mayhew, who had been, who was also on contract with the CIA, to contact uh, mobsters around the country to see if they would form an alliance to work with the CIA to get into uh, to Cuba and kill Castro. And so he first contacted Johnny Rosselli, who was a flamboyant mobster, both operating both in Los Angeles and Las Vegas. And Rosselli then contacted Sam Giancana, who was the uh, boss of the Chicago mob. And uh, the two of them then uh, contacted Santo Traficante, who was the mob boss of Florida and who had long time uh, op uh, casino operations in Cuba before Castro took over. And so they went with Mayhew to Miami Beach and set up a shop in the Fountain Blue Hotel to try to figure out how to uh, get poisons to uh, somebody close to Castro who could kill him. But the, uh, the plot kind of unraveled very quickly because Giancana had a girlfriend in, uh, Las, in Las Vegas, uh, Phyllis McGuire, one of the famous McGuire sisters uh, of a singing act. And he was, he was convinced that she was sleeping with a, a stand-up comedian named Dan Rowan, who later became famous in the Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In show in the late 60s. Uh, and so he wanted to leave and go back to Las Vegas and maybe kill Dan Rowan. Uh, but Bob Mayhew convinced him to stay and keep working on Castro uh, while he got a private investigator to go wiretap uh, Phyllis McGuire to see if it was true. And the uh, private investigator he hired to wiretap Phyllis McGuire did a, a shoddy job and the local police found the wiretap uh, and called the FBI and suddenly J. Edgar Hoover was pulling a thread and finding out all about, through the, the arrest in uh, Las Vegas and the investigation of the wiretap of Phyllis McGuire, they found out about the CIA's uh, mafia alliance. And then that led them to find that Sam Giancana had another mistress uh, named Judith Campbell, who at the same time was also sleeping with President Kennedy. And so very quickly, uh, Jagger Hoover had blackmail material on uh, President Kennedy, and he confronted uh, Robert Kennedy, his brother, who was the attorney general at the time. And then he also confronted President Kennedy. And it's very clear, if you look at the timing, and the, uh, is that what he wanted was greater freedom to act to spy on Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. And it wasn't long after he confronted the Kennedys with this blackmail material about the fact that Kennedy was sharing the same mistress as Sam Giancana, that the Kennedys approved the wiretapping of Martin Luther King by the FBI. And so it was a very convoluted story, but it's probably one of the most fascinating stories in the history of the CIA and the FBI. And, and Jim Risen, if you can continue on that, uh, the wiretapping of Dr. King, a man who, and especially in Jonathan Igg's new biography, uh, King, A Life, talks about how Dr. Martin Luther King suffered from severe depression, was hospitalized a number of times, and how they tried to drive him to suicide, and what the Kennedys right. knew and when they knew it, Jim. Right. One of the things that uh, became clear is that Hoover had been obsessed with uh, King beginning in the late 1950s. As soon as King began to rise to uh, prominence after the Montgomery uh, uh, bus boycott, uh, he was uh, 
in the sights of Hoover, and Hoover began to be, uh, very quickly became convinced that uh, the King and his uh, civil rights movement were controlled by Moscow, and that they were communist puppets. Uh, and he, there were uh, two members of the of King's uh, uh, organization that had some background in uh, the American Communist Party, but there was no evidence of any real influence, communist influence, in the uh, civil rights movement. And the FBI staff, intelligence uh, division staff, continually told uh, Hoover that, and he kept telling them that he didn't agree with them and he wanted them to change their opinion and change their reports. And he put so much pressure on them that they finally just began to harass, uh, come up with plots to harass King however they could. Originally, the wiretapping that the Kennedys approved was supposed to be to find communist infiltration in uh, King's movement. Uh, but very quickly, they realized they weren't, there was no evidence of that, but they were finding evidence that he was having affairs, extramarital affairs. And so they began to focus on his extramarital affairs and then tried, then ultimately, once he uh, won, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, they, uh, that so enraged Hoover that he uh, and uh, his uh, intelligence chief, William Sullivan, began to uh, set up a, uh, a thing where they record, took all the recordings, uh, highlights of the recordings uh, of the wiretaps of his extramarital affairs, and sent them to uh, his house, along with a note saying, um, you have 34 days, you know what you should do, uh, meaning essentially that he, I think he was about to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they wanted him to kill himself before that. Can you, uh, can you talk about, um, uh, in this book, uh, the revelations, what you learned in talking to, it's hard to say, the late Dan Ellsberg, but Daniel Ellsberg, who's just died, um, the right. information of what he gave to Frank Church and how this relates to the assassination of the um, leader, Diem. Yeah, I mean, he gave, he had a lot of information about uh, Vietnam, but he also, it, just to step back one, one step, uh, he had uh, provided, he told me while I was interviewing him the whole backstory to how he ended up leaking the Pentagon Papers and how it, and he first went to uh, J. William Fulbright, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, to try to leak the, uh, to get the Senate to conduct hearings, and Fulbright re uh, refused to do it, and he put the Pentagon Papers, I think in 1969, he, he put them in a safe at the Foreign Relations Committee and didn't do anything with them. And that was one of the reasons, ultimately, that, uh, that, that uh, Ellsberg went to the New York Times was because he had kept going to uh, this, uh, the Senate and being turned down, that ultimately led um, Fulbright, who was so embarrassed by what happened, it led him to leak information to later to Jack Anderson about the CIA and ITT's uh, uh, work in Chile to overthrow Salvador Allende. And that then led to the creation of a subcommittee to investigate all uh, Chile uh, that was chaired by Frank Church, which was a subcommittee that kind of led to the creation of the Church Committee and his larger investigation of the CIA. So it was a very, it was kind of an indirect investigation uh, in tie, but, and then he later also provided information to Church about the Diem assassination and to the fact that uh, there was evidence that Kennedy knew about, uh, he, he understood in detail what was going to happen in the uh, coup plots against Diem that uh, the CIA was involved with. Uh, and the question really boils down to whether or not uh, Kennedy, Kennedy clearly knew there was going to be violence, and, uh, and the question was whether he actually knew that the assassination was, was going to be uh, conducted or not. But 
it was a, it was interesting. He he really wanted to uh, provide new documents to the church committee, and so he met privately with church. Uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you briefly about another pivotal assassination, the killing of Patrice Lumumba and the involvement of the CIA in that. You write about that in your book as well. Yeah, the Lumumba uh, the, the, uh, was one of the uh, assassinations of foreign leaders, along with Castro and others, that the Church Committee investigated uh, and really exposed for the first time. <clears throat> they, um, the CIA, if you remember, Congo was in the midst of uh, uh, extreme violence because it was uh, a Belgian colony, and Belgium had been uh, pressured to uh, get, grant its independence, and Patrice Lumumba was the first independent uh, leader of the independent uh, country. But Belgium very quickly uh, wanted to regain control. They realized they kind of had uh, buyer's remorse about uh, granting Belgium its, I mean, granting Congo its independence. Jim, I want to warn and, you, you just uh, have a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, so. Uh, Patrice Lumumba was overthrown with the backing of Belgium and the CIA, uh, and then he was uh, assassinated. And the question really was uh, the role of the CIA in that assassination, I believe, was much stronger than what the CIA has said over the decades. Uh, there's, there's clearly, uh, the CIA helped track uh, uh, Lumumba as he tried to escape and uh, also had sent hitmen to uh, Congo to try to kill him. So it was, a, it was very clear that the CIA played a pivotal role in all that. James Risen, we're going to do part two of this discussion, and we're going to talk more about what ultimately um, the Church Committee was able to publicly expose um, with these assassinations. James Risen, the Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter at The Intercept, his new book is called The Last Honest Man, the CIA, the FBI, the Mafia, and the Kennedys, and One Senator's Fight to Save Democracy. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.